Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the gift of your church, um, and we pray that you would bless it as it strives to um, proclaim the good news and, um, and act in a godly and, and um, dutiful manner to the commandments that you've given us. I pray, Lord, as we prepare for um, this upcoming GAFCON, that you would bless that work, that you would be in it, that you would be blessed and honored and glorified by all that's said. Let me say a prayer for um, a church convention. Gracious and ever-living Father, you have given the Holy Spirit to abide with us forever. Bless, we pray, with the Holy Spirit's grace and presence, all of the archbishops, bishops, priests, deacons, and lay people who will assemble in Kigali starting on Monday in your name. That your church, being preserved in true faith and godly discipline, may fulfill the will of him who loved her and gave himself for her. Your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, this is my favorite lecture and your least favorite lecture. So everybody get comfortable. Um, and I've given it a million times. I was looking back over like the number of times I have notes on this, and I decided to shake it up a little bit. I'm going to give this lecture in a completely reversed manner so that Morgan doesn't fall asleep as he hears this every year. Okay, so I want to start, because I, I, I've never started this way before. The, tonight's lecture is about polity. It's about how we are organized. Um, I am a lawyer by training, so I like the intricacies of church governance and interrelatability and checks and balances and godly governance. Um, so I like this stuff. Um, but I also thought, you know, to some degree, as you are considering and praying about being confirmed or received or reaffirmed, joining the church, it might be helpful just to see, to begin with, how it is that we're organized as a local parish. And so what I'm about to describe is just Anglicanism in general um, at the parish level. So um, on, on one end, you have the rector. And the rector is uh, me here. Um, but it's just the, 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 the main teaching pastor of the parish. But the, the word literally means king. I mean, it, it, there's, a, there's a great deal of vicarious authority that the bishop instills in the rector and under our bylaws and the bylaws of almost every Anglican church, this is a weird place to start this lecture. I'm the king. I like the way this is going, quite frankly. You may not. Um, but um, the rector has all authority over the building, all authority over music, all authority over worship. Like, if you have a problem or a criticism, don't go to a committee. Come to me. Um, because the buck stops with the rector, and that cuts lots of different ways. But we'll talk about checks and balances on the rector's authority but the rector hires the staff, and, and the staff works at the pleasure of the rector. Um, and, um, and generally, there's all spiritual authority is vested in the rector under the authority of the bishop. Okay, So I am a man under authority. And like I say all the time, the reason why you have vestry and a bishop is that I can't go totally crazy because there are people watching over me. Right? So um, then we elect a vestry, and the vestry is... Um, 12 people here, it's 12 men and women that are um, brought to the attention of the parish by you, the laity, saying these are people who are invested, involved, committed, godly, they've got gifts of discernment and wisdom, and so um, every year we elect 12, uh, we have four that roll off and four that roll on, so there's 12 people that roll, rolling three-year terms. Um, I love the way we do it here, where we draw. We have we have people nominated. We kind of vet them to make sure there's nothing, you know, t troubling going on in their lives. I mean, sometimes people get nominated. And I'm like, you know, we're, we we look at them. We're like, they're going through. They lost their business. They're going through a divorce, and this is just not the time, right? So sometimes, but but eventually, all the names that are vetted go into a hat, and we pick eight names out of that hat, and then we draw four names out of a hat at the annual parish meeting, and y'all vote that slate in. So there's no election. There's no politicking. Y'all have been in churches where people are, like, campaigning to get on vestry. Ugly. Um, so I, I like the way we do it. And then we have an annual parish meeting. Um, and, and the way the annual parish meeting works is that every year y'all, as members, if you're confirmed in the church and you're 
um, known to the treasurer and a re regular worshiper, then you come together to elect your vestry, have a presentation about the budget, um, and um, and hear about the vision that the, the where the where the rector and the staff and the vestry feel like the church is going in the year before. So um, the vestry um, has uh, review authority over the rector. So every year I, I get kind of an annual review from them about how things are going. And if they sense that there are issues between the rector, the vestry, the rector, and the parish, then they can call the bishop in for reconciliation, for counsel, for work. And so there's this, um, this, and this vestry is made up of lay people here, and the annual parish meeting is obviously all lay people. But you have this relationship built in between clergy and laity, so we're all going in the same direction. Um, under kind of the vision cast by the rector, but, but also I'm in constant conversation with, with, the, with the vestry. The vestry also has a senior warden and a junior warden, and the junior warden and senior warden are just kind of the two leading lay people of the church. Lots of conversation go on. There's always two, it's like four speed dials. My wife, my bishop, my senior warden, and my junior warden, and then Morgan. So that's the way my speed dials work, right? And, and that's good, right? So good counsel, good um, checks and balances, et cetera. So um, I start there because um, it, it, it follows right up the chain that the diocese is organized in a similar manner. So we'll talk about the diocese now. So at the top of the, of the, um, of, of the organizational structure is the bishop. So the, the bishop is elected by the synod uh, to serve a, a lifetime term in our context. So there's no term limit on your role as serving as bishop. And the bishop has um, a standing committee. And the standing committee effectively works as, as the vestry of the diocese, okay? So if you think about what a, a diocese is, so uh, in the, in the, we'll talk about this in a minute, but this is the way that the New Testament structured the church. The apostles went out and they planted churches. They spread the gospel. People caught a vision for what God was doing. And um, the bishop would appoint uh, an elder to run that little community of, of believers as they ran off to the next um, you know, village in Turkey to spread the gospel, get a community of people who believed in Jesus, appoint someone to oversee them. And then Paul's always writing letters back to the people that are running the churches saying, hey, I hear heresies arisen or good job or whatever context in which um, the, that overseer, the bishop. So eventually what you found was as, um, as the church expanded, there became... An, a, a bishop, an, a, an, over, an apostle that oversaw a geographic region, and they would have elders in each of those parishes that would be answer to that, that elder that had planted, that, that overseer had planted those churches. Um, and then we'll talk about the way how deacons came into play. But a bishop oversees a geographic region. Our particular diocese is called the Gulf Atlantic Diocese, and our bishop sits in Tallahassee. And our diocese is all of Florida, half of Alabama, a third of Georgia, and a little sliver of Mississippi. So we're kind of non-geographic as we grow into our maturity as the ACNA. But our bishop is Alex Farmer. He lives and works out of the cathedral in Tallahassee. And he has direct oversight over me. And how many churches are now in the diocese? 60 Something like that, 60 churches all throughout Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and a little bit of Mississippi. Um, so uh, we have a six-person standing committee, and that standing committee is three clergy and three lay people, and they're elected by the people of the diocese, and they, on an annual basis, evaluate the bishop. If the bishop did something bad, the standing committee could call the archbishop and ask for help because our bishop's doing something inappropriate. Um, so there's this check and balance between the standing committee and the bishop. And like m me within the parish, the bishop is the, the, the spiritual authority within the diocese, but it's in relationship with the standing committee. Three clergy, three lay people elected to serve, rolling terms. Um, and that relationship is strong. I'm sure if I looked at Alex's phone, it would be Jody and then... Um, Michael Petty, who's the chair of the standing committee right now. And that man back there, Morgan, is on standing committee right now, so show him proper deference. Um, so uh, every year we have a synod, 
And a synod is where um, lay people, clergy, and the bishop get together to talk about life within the diocese. Talk about the vision, the budget. We vote on constitutional and canonical changes to keep ourselves well organized and agile and responsive to issues that arise. But this same model you see at the, at the parish level, you then see at the diocesan level. So you can just substitute rector and vestry and annual parish meeting, and it's pretty much the same model. They're not perfectly synonymous, but they're pretty good. Um, so this is, this is the, the, the model of, of the way the diocese works. So um, I promise this is all leading up to something because I want to talk to you all about what's happening in Kigali next week. So at some point, all this is going to fall apart, okay? Thus far, pretty clear lines of authority, pretty good governance. It gets messy. So let's talk about the province. So we're the Anglican Church in North America, and we've only been around since 2008. So we're pretty young. We're still trying to figure out the world. But we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of church model to follow. So the way... Uh, we're organized as a parish and the way the diocese is organized, pretty much hundreds of years of experience in that. So the way the ACNA is organized is we have an archbishop, um, but he's elected as kind of the first among equals from what we call the College of Bishops. And the College of Bishops is every bishop in the ACNA, retired, diocesan, um, assisting, um, uh, not suffragans, but that's a different issue. Um, but if you were um, consecrated as a bishop, you sit in the College of Bishops and you have say and authority over, like the rector and like the bishop, all spiritual matters. And so we like to describe the College of Bishops as having the fundamental authority within the province to make declarations about doctrine and order within the church. So they, they guard the faith, right? The same way the apostles guarded the faith. We'll, we'll talk in a minute about how each of these bishops can trace their lineage all the way back to one of the original 12 apostles, right? So Alex can trace his lineage all the way back to St. Peter. And there's a line of authority of hands being laid on hand, heads being laid on heads all the way back to the original 12 apostles. And that's, that's true of every bishop within the college. They all can trace themselves back to one of the original 12 apostles. So you have the college of bishops. Um, then you have something we call uh, the provincial council. And the provincial council is like a vestry and like a standing committee, a group of lay people, bishops now, and clergy. So you've got deacons, priests, bishops, and lay people all... Um, not so much, this, at this level, that check and balance kind of falls apart. We all just kind of have different duties, okay? The college is in charge of doctrine and defending the faith. Provincial council is about what kind of provincial activity should we be up to, right? So when you talk, start talking about like international relief and international development and um, relationships with other branches of the Anglican Communion, all that stuff that happens at the provincial level. Nobody's running a church. Nobody's running a cathedral. I mean, this is all um, diocese having conversations about how can we partner together to do bigger work than we could do just as a diocese. So the, the model breaks apart a little bit at this point simply because this is a little bit more um, how can we combine forces to do the work that God's given us to do. And then every five years we have something we call provincial assembly. There is going to be a test at the end of this, so I hope you all are really paying attention. Um, you, no, I'm just kidding, of course. Um, provincial Assembly, every five years, we all come together, um, representatives from every diocese. We have a big worship service. It's a lot of fun. It's usually in, um, in Dallas. And, um, and we hear from provincial council, and we hear from the archbishop, who serves, by the way, five-year terms, and they can do it twice. And Foley Beach is in his last year of tenure. And so we're about to have a new archbishop, which will be very interesting. It'll be interesting to see where the province goes when the new archbishop's kind of... Because it really is interesting because the, the, a bishop is so busy, right? When the college gets together, they're really dealing with controversies, difficulties, bishops behaving badly, like the, the college, or really big... Like right now, they're, they wrestle through... Um, they wrestle through big theological matters, and they write papers, and we read them, and they think, help us think about doctrine and things that the 
culture is challenging us with. Um, provincial assembly is next year, so 2024 we'll all gather in Washington. No, no, no. Provincial Council is in D.C. this year. Provincial Assembly is in Texas. Is that right? I think it is. I think it's going to be in, 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 um, at Christ Church Plano. So, um, so this is a little bit of how you can, again, you can think about it as a vestry, as a rector-ish, um, and as an annual parish meeting slash synod-ish. So, so this is kind of how you can think about how we're organized as, um, as, a, as a province, okay? So hold that in your mind for just a minute. Let me see what's next on the list of things. Why are we organized that way, okay? So did we make that up? Is that something we just said, hey, this is a good way to do governance? Um, and it's not. It's because this really is modeled after the way the early church was organized in the book of Acts. So um, remember back in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes and, and swoops through the room and you have all of these men and women filled with the Holy Spirit, ready to go out and proclaim the gospel through Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and out to the end of the world. And you had those 12 apostles who went out spreading the gospel everywhere that they went, and they would appoint elders to supervise those churches after they were gone. And then you remember in Acts chapter 6, the apostles, you got a letter about this for me in the mail, I hope most of you did, right? Where the apostles were like, we're so busy caring for orphans, widows, and the poor amongst us that we're, we can't proclaim the gospel anymore. So they chose St Stephen and his brethren to be the first deacons, right? And they were the diakonos, which literally means servant, I'm one who waits at table. And Stephen and his brethren um, were men filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to be like that outward facing service arm of the church and that freed the apostles back to being preachers of the gospel um, and so and the early church was organized with uh, an overseer and we would call that eventually episkopos like the word that we use for bishop and there were elders presbyteros where we called them priests in our tradition and they would have authority over a particular community of believers. And then within that community, in order to get the work done, you would have deacons that would be ordained to be that outward face. They would teach. They would care for the poor. They would, they would love the world as it gathered at the doors of the church looking for service. And so to this day, um, the Catholics are organized this way. The Orthodox are organized this way. The Anglicans are organized this way. And as I've reminded you all before, most of you are kind of new to Anglicanism. But we are the third largest, we're the largest Protestant group in the world. Like we're far larger than the Baptist or the Methodist, but, but in a, on a global scale, okay? We are 85 million Anglicans all over the globe. Um, in America, most Anglicans are Episcopalians, but all Episcopalians are Anglicans. When we left the Episcopal Church, we just chose an older name for ourselves to distinguish ourselves theologically from our um, Anglican brothers down the street in Episcopal churches. But in, in that idea that um, in the early church they were organized in this structured way with um, bishops, priests, and deacons serving. Now, what happens next is in Acts chapter 15, a controversy arose. Who can tell me what controversy arose in Acts chapter 15? How does a Gentile become a Christian, right? Do they have to get circumcised? Do they have to keep kosher? Do they have to become Jews, essentially, before they can follow after Jesus? And, and who were the parties arguing in Jerusalem? Like, Peter had just come from Caesarea Maritima, having seen Cornelius be transformed. Remember that vision that um, Peter saw of all that unkosher food hanging out on the floating picnic blanket, right? And, G and God said, eat. And he said, I don't eat this, I'm a Jew. And he goes, do not call unclean what I call clean. And then he meets Cornelius. He sees him find the Holy Spirit. He goes, I get it. God shows no partiality. Like the news is for everyone. So everybody went back to Jerusalem and, and they called all the elders from all over Israel came and gathered from the far-flung regions where the gospel had been proclaimed, they all gathered in Jerusalem to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give them guidance to answer a question that had never, ever, ever, ever been asked before, okay? And the, what was the conclusion? You didn't have to 
become a Jew, right? You had to abstain from food that had been offered to idols, right? So it was like you need to get out of paganism, essentially, right? You can't be a pagan and a Christian. You don't have to be a Jew, just don't be a pagan. And you had to abstain from sexual immorality, right? And so there was a sense in which, like, there are, there are, there are, there are commandments that God gave us for our good, and they involve our bodies, but all the ceremonial law and the political law that God had given the Jews to order themselves religiously and politically as a community, those were not binding on Gentiles. But the moral law that God had given the Jews was binding on them if they wanted to follow after Jesus. And otherwise, they could get baptized and follow after Jesus. Um, we're lucky they said yes, because we probably wouldn't be here before, right? Like Cornelius and Acts chapter 15 they're the great hope for us Gentiles. Maybe some of you, maybe there's a Jew or two in here that was a believer, but most of you are probably Gentiles at this point, right? So we're delighted by what happened there, right? Um, so then you, you, there's no, there's not like there's silence after that. You, you can see church history records flow out of that early church expansion and that principle that when issues arise, who gets together? The bishops get together to pray and ask the Holy Spirit for guidance and wisdom about new issues that arrive. So as early as 88 AD, there was an apostle that was based in Rome. Like there was somebody called Episcopos, which is where we get the word bishop, who lived in Rome and supervised all the churches in the area uh, around the city of Rome. His name was Clement, and he was the bishop of Rome. And we know that Ignatius ruled in, in Antioch. So there was a bishop grounded in Antioch. He was established there. And there were elders that were responsive and obedient to his oversight of their churches. Polycarp was established in Smyrna. So early, like 60 to 100 years after the ascension of Jesus, you had an ordered way of doing church. And I kind of started with those boring little drawings to say, we've We've not found a better system for this, right? This, is a, this system's not perfect because we're humans, but it's a system that's worked since the earliest days of the church. Um, and then what happened in Acts 15 continues to happen. You find a question that arises that you can't just open up your Bible and go, oh yeah, chapter and verse, there's an easy answer to it. Like reasonable minds could disagree about an issue, so what are we going to do? We're going to call a council. And we're all going to get together and we're going to hear from various sides of an issue and ask the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom. So um, we like to say that we uh, confess the, the Nicene Creed and that came out of the Council of Nicaea, right? It's a, a definition of what it means to believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So the first ecumenical council, well, it was not an ecumenical council because there was only one church in the world, but everybody got together in 325 in Nicaea, and Santa Claus was there, right? Like St. Nicholas came to that because why? Because he was a bishop in Turkey. Like he was a episcopos. He'd been laid hands on by a former, he, I don't know, Santa Claus, I don't know what apostle he could trace his lineage back to, but he could because he was in that order of, of the church. Um, and they dealt with um, a major heresy that arose, and it was Arianism, right? Arian believed that Jesus was a created being and not eternal. Um, he actually wrote a pop song called There Was Once When the Sun Was Not, and we have lyrics to it, but we don't know the tune. But people in the early church sung that song. It was a praise and worship song that was heresy, and so um, Santa Claus punched him in the face, right? Um, <clears throat> so well, what's interesting, you probably know about Nicaea and Arianism, but here's interesting things. If you go into the annals of Nicaea, they also talked about that drawing I just drew for you. Like they talked about how a local parish, how a diocese should be organized. They talked about the organizational structure of the church, what authorities would be given to bishops, and what authorities they could they could um, vicariously pass on to elders in their particular churches. They talked about dignity standards for the clergy, like what kind of background someone should have before they were even considered to be ordained, um, what kind of um, uh, suitability of behavior would be. So you can read it. Like they had, 
little, you know, sidebars and side conversations that ordered the church. And this is in the year 325. Um, when someone sinned and was, was excommunicated, how would you reconcile lapsed believers, right? Norms for public repentance and making penance. Um, how a heretic or a schismatic could be reintroduced to the church. So they were talking about grace at the Council of Nicaea. We don't tend to think about the early church as being all that graceful. They were making hard decisions and killing heretics. But they were. They were working on it, right? Um, they actually had reordination and rebaptism things that they were considering. So this is early church wrestling, right? And they also talked about how to do church. They had liturgical norms. What would a deacon do at the altar? What would a priest do at the altar? Um, did, you, did you stand or kneel or sit during prayer? I mean, there were fun conversations going on. You can read all about Nicaea. So, um, but the principle is, and we'll get to why I'm talking about all this in a minute when we start talking about next week. Um, you can look at um, the First Council of Constantinople in 381, Ephesus in 431, Chalcedon in 451, Constantinople in 553. There's seven big councils of the church, and it was all the bishops in the world getting together to wrestle over heresies or big decisions where we needed some guidance and some order. Now, I would say this, that until the Reformation, that was pretty much how every church was organized. Um, with bishops, with priests, with deacons, with annual meetings, with councils called when there were chaos moments. Um, under a bishop in apostolic succession who met with other bishops to guard the faith, overseeing churches in their area with priests and deacons serving at the local level. And that's still how we're organized today. Bishop as the primary authority, overseeing priests like me, and then at my church, I have oversight over the flock and the staff. Like So Father Morgan is an associate rector under me, but, it, but we work together greatly, but at the end of the day, the buck would stop with the rector in a church. And so those structures um, are still in place. So now, let's talk about um, the global communion because we have n no such order. All these pretty, clean, neat, largely synonymous diagrams I've been drawing completely fall apart when you start talking about the global Anglican communion. And, and I'll say first, because the Anglican communion, the globally speaking, was an accident of history. Nobody planned the Anglican Communion. Um, so uh, what did the sun never set on? The British Empire, right? It's the largest empire that the world had ever known. And as the English went out from the British Isles and basically economically conquered the world, um, they were the wealthiest, most dominant um, uh, economy and military force that the world had ever known. Um, everywhere they went, they brought the gospel of Jesus along with missionaries and what did they do when they arrived in a place they were colonizing? Well, they would teach the gospel of Jesus, but they would do it in a way ordered by the way the English Reformation had taken place. And for reasons that I know you already heard a history lecture from Father Morgan, just remember that when the English went through the Reformation, they were deeply influenced by reformers on the continent. They knew their Calvin, they knew their Luther, they knew their Zwingli, like they'd wrestled over problems and heresies within the Episcopal Church and theological understandings that were scripturally based. And of course, we made massive contributions to the fact that Reformation happened at all. Like without Wycliffe and Tyndall, there wouldn't have been a Reformation, right? I mean, putting the Bible in people's hands, publishing it, getting it out there, led to this upswell of this idea that we're going to read scripture uh, and figure out how to do church together. But because of various political reasons, we kept all of that Catholic structure of how to be organized, how to do worship, how to exercise our spiritual life within the liturgy. All of that happened in a way that I don't really like the term via media because reformed Catholicism is the way we like to describe it. Like we kept um, 
the liturgy and the, and the prayer book captured so much of the most beautiful things about Catholic liturgy and put it in the language of the people and put it in the hands of the people. Like the fact that that red book is in your pew is one of the great gifts of Anglicanism to the world of the Reformation. Like let's put prayer, daily office, daily scripture reading. We invented the idea of read the Bible through in a year, um, no matter what the Baptist might say. Um, and, um, and so, but... When it went out and, and our particular way of worshiping Jesus spread, um, the Uganda became an Anglican nation. So as the, the tribal faiths of Uganda were converted to faith in Jesus, they did so with bishops, and priests, and deacons, and vestments, processional crosses, Eucharist, prayer books. I mean, I have a Ugandan prayer book. It reads a lot like ours, right? Actually, it reads like, like the 79 prayer book. But they've had successive prayer books that they wrote for their little area of Anglicanism. Canada is an, Angl is an Anglican country. Um, uh, the, um, you think about Uganda, you think about Nigeria, you think about South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. They're all Anglican countries because they were all part of the Commonwealth at some point. Um, and the first 13 colonies were what? We were British colonies. And so when, we, when, the, when they came over to colonize the New World, everybody was an Anglican. The Puritans were a break-off sect of Anglicanism, but everybody was an Anglican, right? So when we won the war in 1776, and we kicked the Redcoats out, everyone looked around at each other going, well, um, how are we going to do church? Like, all of our bishops... Were, were English bishops. There were no bishops consecrated on American soil. And so, you know, it's a quirk of history that in 1777, the, the decision was, well, we're not going to call ourselves Anglicans anymore. Let's call ourselves, an Anglican is just an adjective that means English, right? Let's give ourselves another adjectival name. They call themselves Episcopalians, which basically just means a church that has bishops. So the Episcopal Church emerged out of the Revolutionary War, but the idea was we want to stay in relationship with the, the font of our way of worshiping Jesus, but we're going to do so in a way that's kind of unique to the creation of a new American nation, an American spirit. So I say all that to say that as the British Empire withdrew back to the islands, they left behind... One of the greatest vestiges of colonialism was faith in Jesus, but done so in a way that was ordered and organized, the way the early church was organized, but the way that the Anglicans had taught them to. As a total aside, I, I went to Uganda a few years ago, and I did a weekend retreat for all the clergy of the Zabay Diocese, and I, I'd spent a day talking about expository preaching, and then I spent a whole day doing like a massive version of the instructed Eucharist we did two weeks ago for y'all, right? And, um, and it was fun to see these guys all dressed like me. I mean, they're, they're all priests. Um, and uh, they didn't know why they did many of the things that they did. Like um, at the beginning of the service, everybody always stands up. And I asked them why they stand up because the priests came in. And I was like, no, it's because a cross came in. Like, they'd for, they, they'd all, none of them had processional crosses. And I said, the reason you stand up is not for the guy in the shirt, but for the cross of Christ. And that's the way, that's the reason for it. And they're like, we didn't know that. So I was like, y'all go out in the woods and everybody make a processional cross and start using one in the liturgy so people are standing up for the right reason. Or tell people to stop standing up. Because if they think they're standing up to honor you, then that's getting things out of order. So they all have processional crosses. Now, it was just kind of interesting to see that they, I actually finally said, you know, someone said, we stand up because that's the way the British taught us to do it. And that was that, that's that vestige of colonialism that, that, we, were, that we were talking about, right? Um, so um, this is the way this works. So as the British Empire withdrew back to the islands, they left behind um, Anglican churches in 38 different areas of the world, roughly speaking, okay? And I like to think about the Anglican communion as a table, okay? So you imagine a big, big, big table. At the head of the table is the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, now, before the, the, withdraw the, the British Empire began to recede, 
there was one bishop over every single Anglican all across the world that wasn't in the British Isles, and it was the Bishop of London. So if you were the Bishop of London, you had to run London, which sounds like hard enough, right? But um, nobody had a bishop out there in the far-flung regions of the world. Uganda didn't have any bishops. They all had to call London, however you did that, to get oversight the way that they needed oversight. And so as um, the colonial reigns were, or, or they were, or they, people you know, broke free of colonialism, they started to consecrate their own bishops. And each of these provinces began to have their own um, structures and authority. So um, you can imagine Nigeria and Uganda and Rwanda and um, Kenya and the United States of America, we call that the Episcopal Church, um, the uh, Anglican Church of Canada, um, um, uh, who was it? Australia. Um, there's, um, there's a whole or organization in the Middle East. There's an archbishop that oversees all the churches that are in the Middle East area. In the faith. So there's 38 of these all around the table. And um, how do they relate to each other? So every single one of these provinces, we call these provinces, are essentially autocephalous, like they're, they're essentially authorities unto themselves. Like I, we've described all of those beautiful checks and balances of vestries and standing committees and provincial assemblies where you have lay people working with priests and deacons and bishops to get the work of the church done. And um, there's ways to, to check and discipline and, and, and defrock and, and, and you can discipline bishops. There's ways of doing that. There is no way in which these provinces are related um, such that if the Church of England, um, where the Archbishop of Canterbury serves as its head of the Church of England, begins to say doing gay marriages, which they just voted to do three months ago, right? There's no way that these other provinces can say, hey, 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 you're breaching the bonds of communion. Like you're stepping beyond what was handed down to us once for all from the saints. So if the Church of Nigeria started to say, which they never would, that, the, that as a matter of theology, the resurrection didn't happen. Like there's no way these other provinces would be able to exercise any discipline towards the Church of Nigeria. They, they come sit at this table just because of the history of, of, of who we are. So over the years, um, there's been a number of attempts to build in structures that allow us to stay related to one another um, across a lot of cultural and theological differences. Um, and the first one we call these the instruments of unity. Um, and the instruments of unity are um, first the Archbishop of Canterbury. And um, if there's one thing that I wish I could just kill about Anglicanism, it's our um, weddedness to the idea that somehow the Archbishop of Canterbury has some sort of extra authority just because of the history of who we are as a people. Like, he's not the Pope. He has no papal authority. He cannot speak doctrine. Um, and we've had a bunch of heretics in that role over the years. But he continues to sit as the first among equals of all of these. We, we would call these guys, um, every one of these chairs would be filled with um, the Archbishop of that province, right? Um, and, um, and so they, we call them primates because they're like the primary representative of a province. So at that table, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury sits as its head. And there's just, uh, um, it just happens to be the, that, that focus of unity because the idea is how can you be Anglican if you're not related to the font of Anglicanism? And the Archbishop of Canterbury represents that in his person. Um, so in uh, 1876, I mean, I'm sorry, 1867. I love this date. When, I, when you ask me about the Anglican Union, I will tell you the Anglican Communion began in 1867. Before that, there was a British church that had spread all over the world, but they didn't really have any interest in caring for all of those far-flung branches of the church. And in 1867 was the first time we called something called the Lambeth Conference. And the Lambeth Conference became a once-every-five-year um, invitation of every bishop in the world to come to Lambeth Palace, which is the residence of the Archbishop of Canterbury, to talk 
about what it means to be an Anglican worldwide, okay? And so suddenly you had bishops from Africa and bishops from North America and, and bishops from Asia coming to London to talk about what it means to be a global body of believers and not just um, a far-flung branch of the Church of England. And what's made more complicated by all of this, I'm, I'm in trouble, um, is that um, none of these churches are a state church except the font of it all, right? So the Church of England is, of course, a state church. If you're a priest in the Church of England, you're a state employee. Like, I mean, think about that for just a minute, right? Like, you have a, a national pension plan because you work for the state wearing a collar, right? And nobody else is a state church. And so sometimes there would be proposals um, for building unity at that table across all these provincial lines. And the Church of England would say, can't do it, sorry, because the queen would have to sign off on it, right? And um, one little side point is that you'll notice that they didn't start really getting far afield in the area of sexuality in the Church of England until she died. Because she said, not on my watch, right? But Charles doesn't care. So that's one of the reasons you're seeing this groundswell of like, finally, we've got rid of the queen and we can move on with doing what the culture really wants us to do. And of course, that deeply upsets the Nigerians and the Ugandans and the Rwandans for whom sexual purity is, is an essential item for them in their faith, as it should be. And they're also facing um, Islamic pressures, right? Um, and that's a whole other conversation. Okay, um, 1867 was when the Lambeth Conference began to be called. There's another really interesting date. Uh, 1978 was the first time that this table was ever set up. So think about how young the Anglican Communion actually is. In 1978, the Archbishop of Canterbury called something called the Primate Council. And he says, hey, I don't want a Lambeth Conference. I want to just talk to the Archbishop. So everybody come, if you're a primate, you're the primary representative of one of the provinces, come talk to me. Um, and that was 1978. And you would think that that body of people could actually get some work done. But again, um, uh, Archbishop Welby is famous for saying, um, as Archbishop of Canterbury, I, am, I have no power to say no to anything. I can only say yes. And if that's all the authority you have as the head of that table, then we need a new table. We need some covenantal structures. One of the great things about Anglicanism is that we don't have a primary um, uh, um, reformer, so we can say my reformer is better than your reformer. You know, if you listen to Calvin, we listen to Luther, we Cranmer and um, Hooker. I mean, we had lots of Anglican divines, but it's not like there's this one guy that what everything he said. Like I, I heard the other day that there's there are classes on Calvin's Institutes that you can take um, in church. And I'm like, we don't have that guy where we're going to study his writings as if it's like quasi-scripture, right? Um, and uh, um, we also, uh, we, so, so the idea is um, we, we don't have that sense of um, our identity is about prayer, about gathering, about worship. Um, and, uh, and being faithful as God's people to do the work he's given us to do. And there are ways in which this table could be organized to empower us to do that. Um, and, and what we're looking for now are some more, um, some, some, a little bit, we don't have a confession that we all have to ascribe to. Um, and, and so what we're looking for as we start building a new table, which is one of the reasons why I'm going to Kigali next week, is to start really working on that table is to maybe not have a confession, but have some, this is the basic covenant that we enter into to call ourselves Anglican. And um, if you don't abide by that covenant as a priest, or as a parish, or as a diocese, or as a province, there are ways to discipline you so that we can keep orthodoxy at the center of who we are. We currently don't have that, and that's what we're going to. So the 78 was the first primate council. Um, there's one other, there's four of them, and it's called the Anglican Consultant Council, but I wouldn't bother with it. It's a bunch of liberals. Don't worry about it. Okay, um, so, um, so what we're trying to do now, so, so back up to like the late 90s, um, 
there were a bunch of us in tech in the, the Episcopal Church that said, you know, we've got um, bishops who don't believe in the virgin birth. We have bishops writing books about how the resurrection didn't really happen. It was just a resurrection in people's hearts. And we used to put heretics to death, and now we send them on book tours. And, um, and so there was this outcry amongst the Orthodox saying, we need to be defrocking bishops. We need to be disciplining clergy. Um, I have a whole um, document, if you're interested, called um, Tearing the Fabric of the Communion to Shreds. And if anyone ever says, um, oh, y'all are just homophobic, and it's just about like what people do in their bedrooms, you're like, okay, let's, let's put that issue aside, like God's creation of us male and female and his desires for us with our sexual selves. Let's put that aside and just ask these questions, like, how would you feel if instead of reading the New Testament reading every week, I started reading from the Quran? Like, would you think that I should be disciplined for that? Yes, I should be disciplined. Call the bishop immediately, right? That's what you do. And well, that happened in Michigan, and um, the bishop thought that was awesome. Just a great sign of acceptance and love and, and ecumenical. And that's not ecumenical. That's just outright heresy, right? I mean, that's, and so um, another story is that at the cathedral in San Francisco or L.A., I can't remember which, California, it all kind of disappears in my mind. Um, uh, they, um, they had a bunch of um, Hindu monks come in and they moved the altar off the dais and they built a sand mandala. You know what I'm talking about? Where they put those grains of sand and then they blow them all away, showing the, the you know, ephemeral nature of human existence and then on so the, the the cathedral gathered to watch this happen and then they the priest celebrated communion but they let the hindu monks be the ones distributing the host and the wine right you're like you can't make this stuff up i got tons of them right um like ways that orthodox priests were being disciplined and fired and locks on doors, computers shut down overnight. Anytime you were trying to be super orthodox and faithful within the Episcopal Church, you were getting regularly shut down by growing liberalism within the, the rank of bishop. And so we, um, we fought for decades and decades and decades, and don't get me started on the way the seminaries hurt us instead of helped us. And so we left. But if you want to be an Anglican, for better or for worse, until we build some new structures, you need to be sitting at this table, okay? Because this is all we got. This is what Anglicanism is. So um, Anglicanism is still a work in progress. So don't be worried about all of this. Just realize that you're still in on the ground floor. Like, we've only really been around since 1867, which is not, I mean, the Civil War had just ended, right? Like, we're, we're pretty new and still trying to sort it out, even though we're the largest body in the world because the British Empire was so big. We have a lot of bodies to throw at these problems, but we're working on solving them. And again, that's why I'm about to fly to Africa next week, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. So, so here's Andrew. Um, I was at an Episcopal church in DC. Uh, I was a lawyer in DC, and I felt a call to seminary. When I went to seminary, I was a part of an Episcopal church, and I was postulant, which means ready for ordination, under um, Peter Lee, who was the Bishop of Virginia. Yeah, 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 good. Um, so about three months after I showed up in seminary, um, the Falls Church, which was my home parish, left the Episcopal Church, and they went and they became a Nigerian parish. So to, in order to stay at this table, they became Nigerian. Um, lots and lots of churches left earlier, and they became Rwandan. This particular parish when that group walked out of Ascension, and I know it wasn't just Ascension, it was St. John's folks, and there were Holy Spirit folks, Holy Comforter folks, and Grace folks, and some people who weren't even Anglicans who jumped on board with that movement of 500 people who walked away from Ascension. Um, they became, they hid behind the Archbishop of Uganda. So they stayed at the table, right? But they did so by, by connecting themselves to other provinces of the worldwide communion. Now, let me just make a point real fast because it's an important one. There are 85 million Anglicans in the world. Um, 25 million of them are in Uganda. And guess what they do every single Sunday? They go to church for six hours. Like, they're serious. Like, they, they make us look like, we need to learn something about worship. I mean, they're, it's amazing. They walk two hours, they worship for six, they walk home. That's Sunday for them. It's amazing. Um, 
Nigeria, similar numbers. So, and between Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, and Rwanda, um, there's easily 60 to 70 percent of the entire worldwide communion is grounded in East Africa. And the East African revival made it all the richer. I mean, you should go to Uganda with us sometimes. You will be changed by it. It's incredible, right? But they have no money, right? So, and it used to be that when they sat at this table, um, there was incredible amounts of money in text and incredible amounts of history and money and prestige and snobbery in the Church of England, right? And so to stay connected to the table meant that you could get a water well and you could build a school and you could get a clinic in your village because, you know, there's just one church in the Episcopal Church, Trinity Wall Street, that basically owns Lower Manhattan, right? And their, their I think, what is their endowment? Like, is it like $2 billion or maybe more than that, right? I mean, they own, Queen Anne gave them Lower Manhattan. I mean, they own it. The, the, the diocese owned it. So um, you could just, um, here's a little aside. So if I became, a, say, say I'm a Kenyan priest and they elect me bishop of my little diocese in like Western Kenya, I get a golden ticket in the mail the next week from the Archbishop of Canterbury. And it's a plane ticket on British Air to come meet with him in London. I've never been on a plane before in my life. Probably never been in an elevator before in my life, right? So I get on a plane and I go to, to Lambeth and they wine me and they dine me and they get a $10,000 check in my hand as I leave for whatever project I want. I'm the bishop. And then you hear from, you know, the movement towards orthodoxy, stop taking money from them, stop buying in to the colonial system that continues to operate. And they're like, yeah, but if I, I got a water well and I got a clinic out of it. So you're looking at, there's a lot of politics involved in all of this. And of course, where politics is, money is, and money, power, and politics continue to inform all of these things. So when we left, we became all of these various things. Um, and then it took us about, a decade or so to kind of get our ducks in a row, and we formed the ACNA. Um, the ACNA is the Anglican Church in North America, that's in backwards, I know, um, and that's what we're a part of, okay? So all of us left our, and we said, thank you, you saved us, and we left our, um, our direct affiliation with them, but that's the reason why we go back to Uganda and we send money to Uganda all the time, and we're partnered with Paul because we're thankful that our first bishop was that black man, Augustine Salimo, on the wall in the Canterbury Hall. Like, may we never forget that we are Ugandans, you know, which I think is a beautiful thing to say in Montgomery, Alabama, that where our 99% white church identifies itself at our core as a bunch of Ugandans who were under the authority of Augustine Salimo for most of our early years. Praise the Lord for that. May we, may we never lose that, right? But as we form the ACNA, I like to say that we, we sit over here in the corner, okay? We, we got a chair. We're in timeout over here because 80%, um, 70% of the Anglicans say, hey, the ACNA is the authentic expression of Anglicanism in North America, right? Because our, our province, the ACNA, is all of Canada, all of the United States, and all of Mexico. So you are in a, a province that is Can Canadian, American, and Mexican, um, um, well, actually, yeah, so, um, and more probably. Um, but, um, but they said they deserve a seat here. And, and there was some movement from the Archbishop of Canterbury saying, hey, you know, I don't care, it's my table, uh, and it's not that they're gonna influence my, but Tech said, no way, no way. You let them belly up to this table, and we're gonna cut off a spigot, right? And we pay for most of the activities involved around this table, right? So, um, so as the ACNA formed, um, we're growing rapidly. I mean, we're planting churches, we're growing. We've got growing pains, there's no doubt about it. But you know, the Episcopal Church continues to shrink drastically. Baptisms, marriages on decline, funerals on the rise. Um, the Church of England continues to have empty churches. You wanna see growth? It's the evangelicals in, in England that are spreading the gospel and people are getting converted and there's growth within orthodox branches of the Church of England. Um, but now we get to GAFCON. So there's two big things going on right now. One's called GAFCON. 
GAFCON is the Global Anglican Futures Conference. There's been four of them. Um, the first one was in Jerusalem, then in Nairobi, again in Jerusalem, and then next week, the fourth one's happening in Kigali, Rwanda. And GAFCON was a, um, a movement that emerged out of all of these faithful Africans to say, we want to stand up for the gospel, and we want to start gathering together, free of all of this British influence, and talk about what it really means to be a faithful, God-proclaiming, orthodox, historically grounded Anglican. And they are joyful conferences. If you ever get a chance to go to one, you should go. The worship is sweet, the preaching is amazing, and they always have a communique. And that letter that goes out to the churches says, this is what it means to be Anglican. Not to be related to jolly old England, not to wear funny, fancy clothes and have incense. It means to be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ and faithful to what God commands us in Scripture because His commandments are for our good and not to harm us. They're for our health and our good. Our, our good. Um, there's also something called the Global South. Now, the Global South is funny. Um, over the years, um, the tech and, uh, and Church of England just got tired of all the whining that was coming from the black-skinned folks at the table. This is just true. So they said, let's make them their own little group so we don't have to talk to them so much. So they formed something called the Global South. I'm like, y'all meet. We'll give you some money. Look, this is our um, sandbox. We built you your own sandbox. Go get away from us. Uh, and, you, you know, come to these things. But otherwise, why don't you just go do your African thing someplace else? Of course, the Global South represents all of the, the population of the Global Communion. And the Global South has been unbelievable. Because they said, you know what? We'll just build a new thing all together. And so they're over here constructing this table. And the new table will have a chair here, but it'll rotate. Sometimes it'll be the Archbishop of Uganda. Sometimes it'll be the Archbishop of Kenya. Sometimes it'll be the Archbishop of the UCA. Um, and you want a seat at this table? You come in as a diocese. You don't even come in as a province. You come in as a diocese. You want to be a part? I'll show it to you. You sign what's called the Cairo Covenant. And the Cairo Covenant is a statement of Orthodox Christianity with all the bells and whistles and teeth. And it says, if you preach this covenant, then there are disciplinary processes where you, 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 you can't vote at our assemblies. You can come as an observer, but you lose your power to vote when you come because you've distanced yourself from us because the Cairo Covenant has teeth. Nothing about any of these instruments has any teeth. They're just like wine and cheese parties, right? Um, so we're going to build something that has teeth. And this, I can describe to you, there's, um, there's assembly, global assembly, there's, power, there's a bishop's a meeting, there's all the things about those early structures I started with, it, that's the model, where there's checks and balances, there's lay voice, bishop voice, clergy voice, but the main thing about this new table is that everybody who sits at this table is invited to sit at this one too. But if you want to sit at this table, you have to sign the Cairo Covenant. And nobody in the Church of England is going to sign the Cairo Covenant. Because to do so would be to say, I, I will um, you know, repent of the liberalism that's been built into the structures of the Church of England. Um, there will be a few tech guys that want to join, but you've got to come in as a diocese. And most of the faithful dioceses within the Episcopal Church left a long time ago, right? Fort Worth left en masse to become Anglican. Pittsburgh left en masse to become ACNA. Um, Quincy left en masse to become members of the ACNA. So there were a few faithful dioceses, but most of them are Anglican. So I expect very few tech people will sign on to the new table. Now next week, so GAFCON is um, kind of like a missionary organization, and the Global South is all about structure. Um, if we could get these two little groups to, to, to play in the same sandbox, <coughs> we'd have this new table built. Mm -hmm. So pray next week, and you can watch GAFCON. Everything that happens next week is going to be live streamed. I've got Kigali <coughs> in the upper corner of my new iWatch. 
in Kigali. It's 2 a.m. in Kigali right now. Um, and, um, but you can watch all the video on Cape Belay, so maybe you can see me in the crowd of 1300. Um, I'll, I'll be the guy in the collar like everybody else. And, um, but, um, but I am hoping that when that letter comes out at the end of this, it says this. Um, we're no longer going to anything that involves this thing. Like we, we, or we, we love the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's welcome to come join us if he'd like to, but we're doing this and this. Um, we're not going to Lambeth anymore. We're not going to Chinese temples over there anymore. We're going to build this table. And we in Gafcon are going to enter in to the Global South covenanted structures that they've built. Um, we will be a missionary organization, and the Global South will form the, the, the opportunities for us to gather together. Um, and, um, and so um, there's a lot of purple shirts with authority in this group. There's a lot of purple shirts with authority in this group. Too many purple shirts. We just need to, like, come together and get this thing done. Um, but all of this is to say, as a local parish, we're well organized. Our diocese, we're organized. As a province, we're well organized. And if you looked into each of these provinces, you'd see, generally speaking, checks and balances. Um, but at the global level, because nobody planned this, it was just an accident of colonialism, we're still trying to figure out how it is that we would be related. And because of so much economic power, because of colonialism, um, is that, that's kind of like congealed at these heretical ends of the table. It's hard for the Orthodox to get anything done there. And if we could just say, you know what? To be an Anglican means to worship and to pray and to, and to serve Almighty God in a way that is faithful to the way the Reformation happened in the British Isles, but doesn't need England to authenticate what it means to be Anglican is to confess something together. Um, so I encourage you a couple of things. Um, you might want to write this down. So go search uh, the name Stephen Knoll when you get to that home. N-O-L-L. -L. Um, he has a website. Um, StephenKnoll.com is like that. So for sure. Put in Stephen Knoll Anglican. And he wrote something called 14 Theses for a Revitalized Anglican Communion. Um, you can read the two-page version or the 49-page version. The 49-page version is not a hard read, and it will give you tons of, of texture to the brief lecture that I just gave about all of this. But I commend that to you. Go to the GAFCON website, so gafcon23.org, um, and you can um, watch all the sessions if you want to. Um, I, I would recommend that you subscribe to the, Ang the Anglican um, um, the American Anglican Council, the AAC. I'm on the board of the AAC. You've heard Phil Ashby speak here before. Um, we'll be doing communications from GAFCON about what's going on and what movements towards this. Now, I might not get what I want. In fact, at 8 a.m. this morning, I had a, a Zoom with Phil, and I said, Phil, what's the dream? Like, what's the, what the best thing that could happen coming out of Kigali? And he instantly said this. And I said, well, that would be really great. Um, but everything we do is the long game, right? In the church, everything's the long game. We might not get this union yet. I've been giving this lecture now for seven years, and I always say that this is going to happen, and I never know. Um, but, uh, but may it, we leave the communion better than we found it. Uh, I hope that you're not discouraged by any of this, because I think there's great, godly stuff going on, and it actually kind of helps that after the Queen's death, the Church of England came out so boldly um, in favor of same-sex marriages and, and um, because it allowed uh, the last idea that maybe the Church of England would just uh, would stay orthodox on this issue. The cultural pressures for it are immense. And of course, I always describe that as like, that's the tip of the iceberg. Like, you know, we always talk about the sexuality stuff because it's such a present issue in our culture, but the iceberg under the water is what destroys the ship, right? And it's just the lack of authority. Like if you don't, if the scriptures are not authoritative, then nothing is authoritative, right? And so we want to ground ourselves in what the word of God calls us to, not just sexually, but because what we confess to be true about Jesus and the resurrection and the virgin birth and, res and resurrection and, and like our hopes for future life and eschatological hope with the Lord. 
That all comes from Scripture. And if I say, well, I don't agree with this about Scripture, then, then really all bets are off and the church can go any way it wants to go. And we want to be grounded in something good and true. It is 7.05. Like one question, David. Say the good one. Yeah. The ACC, the liberal group, yeah. what are they and what is their relationship to the ACC? So, so the Amer yeah, different. Oh, so the, um, so the, Amer the um, Anglican Conservative Council was, um, I mean, let me just say, you know, I, I, I'm no ACC expert. So let's see what I said in a previous lecture when I did some research about it. Um, I didn't care about it that year, apparently. Um, <laughs> I didn't care about it that year either. I know I cared about it one year. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of like a, 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 a group that if, the Anglican Consultative Council was formed in 1971, and it's kind of like a staff for the Worldwide Communion. So if, the, if that table says, hey, we want to do something, we want to get together and have a theological conference on the following topic, they would execute it. Uh, but what you found is, is this has just been an incredible hotbed for heterodoxy. Mm -hmm. Like the, the faces that get appointed to the ACC by the primates have been just pretty uniformly um, heretics. Um, they write, they're the ones that, that get the money from Trinity Wall Street and write all the checks to the new bishops. So they're kind of that executive arm. Maybe, maybe this is the year I said a bunch about it. Oh yeah, here you go. Um, was created um, in 68, first met in 71. They meet at three year intervals. The council is bishops, clergy, and laity chosen by the provinces as a permanent secretariat, same as the community office. And the Archbishop of Canterbury is the president of the ACC, but it basically becomes just their arm for getting stuff done. And most of what they get done ain't worth doing, is kind of what we would say about so that. So they don't exercise any influence in the AC? No, 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 no. They, none at all. None at all. Um, in fact, yes. You know, the fact that we never got a seat at this table may have been the best thing that ever happened to us, right? Because I'd rather have a seat at this table any day. I have two. Yeah, so the ACC is the Anglican Consultative Council. Bad. The American Anglican Council, the AAC, good. Um, it is, uh, um, in, in fact, in many ways, the AAC, where I sit on the board of, I didn't sit on the board back when this happened. But all of these relationships, when we left and became Uganda and Rwanda and Nigeria, and they were the ones that were working the back hallway relationships to say, hey, would you give shelter to this parish? Hey, would you give shelter to this diocese if they came out? And so they were always, they were the thorn in the side of the Episcopal Church and the thorn in the side of the Church of England because they were like, no, 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 no. We need to stand for something, right? So you, as you join Christ Church, we welcome you. Um, we pray that um, you come here and worship every single Sunday for the rest of your life and you hear the gospel and we're transformed by it. Um, and that the politics of this um, are never going to impact your life. But you want you to know that if you want to be involved in being part of a real reformation, within the largest Protestant group in the world, it's happening before your eyes. And so you're kind of, you're in a reformation moment. Um, this is crazy and complicated, but it's really happening. So, all right, I got two little boys that are probably shoving hot dogs at each other right now. So God bless y'all. Thank you for uh, enduring Andrew's polity lecture. May God, God be glorified by it all.